Okay, I wanted to share something from a book I've been reading. Just what I've caught on from it so far. Excellent, excellent book on self-control. So it begins with this vignette about a squirrel uh, saving, nut, saving nuts, uh, depositing, them, depositing them in a hollow of a tree. And the author says that the squirrel doesn't need to worry about the long view. The squirrel just wakes up one day and finds itself, uh, finds saving nuts intrinsically valuable. It just wakes up one morning and finds this intrinsically value valuable, momentarily pleasurable. It just goes about saving these nuts. Uh, it doesn't have to exert any kind of self-control. Mother Nature takes care of the long view. Mother Nature has an its genetic predisposition. Like that's what the squirrel is made to do, right? But humans, on the other hand, humans don't have this luxury. If we don't take care of the long view ourselves, if we just trust Mother Nature or our gen just predispositions, uh, just run on moment momentary pleasures, what we want to do, our immediate des desires, then we find that a pattern of behavior, a pattern emerges from our actions that we did not choose. And this is actually what happens to, let's say, alcoholics. Um, they never chose to be an alcoholic. They just chose to have a drink now, 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 and now, right? And that's kind of the existential dilemma that faces humans is that the future as the future never arrives except that in the way, except as converted into the present, right? The future is, the future is always converted into present day actions, present actions. And the, the dilemma is that in the present, we want to do, say, X, right? We want to do X. And in the future, we want to do Y. Uh, but the future can only be acted upon in the present when we want to do X, okay? And that's kind of the dilemma here. So, and yet self-control is kind of so essential to happiness. Uh, there's no happiness without it uh, for humans, right? Especially... Um, since we live in civilization, we have to be civilized. And actually, uh, if you know Freud, Freud talked about this in uh, Civilization and Its Discontents, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, this idea, can you can really build on this idea. So this idea about patterns, like patterns of actions, there's kind of very profound truth in this because so much of the good life is about opting for these patterns of behavior that... Taken momentarily, none of those actions in a pattern are de as desirable as something else. And yet, somehow, you have to make yourself opt for these better patterns of behavior. So what do I mean by this? Take alcoholism versus sobriety, right? Uh, so what what is sobriety? Sobriety is again and again and again and again choosing not to take the drink, okay? Uh, time and time again, you're making the choice that is less, way less desirable, way less pleasurable, has, has way less local utility. It has global utility, as in, if you can keep up a lifetime of sobriety, or let's say you can keep up even 10 years of sobriety, then there is a tremendous, tremendous payoff. Anybody, virtually anybody, would prefer to, let's say, live a healthy 10 years, as opposed to being an alcoholic, or a couch potato, or a smoker, uh, any other kind of... Uh, <laughs> can't find the word right now I'm trying to find a word that means like a de de decrepit or whatever let's keep going with this uh, so we have to opt for these patterns uh, and, and let's give another example so in the book he gives some nice examples like uh, he's talking about listening to a symphony right if you compare listening to a symphony to uh, uh, listening to a pop song three minutes of a pop song to listening to three minutes of a symphony if you like symphonies that is of course so no three minutes of that symphony are going to be as equal in, in like pleasure as that pop song probably, right? And yet the, the symphony, when taken in its gestalt, in its whole, when writ large, uh, that symphony gives you so much more life satisfaction, let's say, if, again, you're into symphonies, than that three minutes pop song, right? Or uh, he gives another example of um, going for a swim, and he has to get over that hurdle of the first four minutes of like uh, changing the clothes, getting into that water when he's feeling all grog, like still sleepy, that chilly, feeling chilly in the morning and stuff. And yet as a habit, as a pattern of life, going for a swim every day works wonders for his life satisfaction. Uh, and yet no four minutes of that entire swim 
give kind of counterbalance that four minutes of discomfort in the beginning. It's just so in, incomparable, right? Uh, the discomfort you have to face initially, even when, with like writer's block, that's another example he gives. A writer, uh, the first hour is the hardest. Once you get writing, then it's easy. But that getting, slogging through that first hour or so of writing to unlock that momentum. And yet writers put themselves through that, even though no pleasure from any other hour of writing comes even close to rivaling the discomfort of that first hour. And yet they opt for that pattern of life because it, it gives so much life satisfaction, right? And of course here, habit. Habit plays a key, key role. And there was a nice quote uh, from William James about how habits are the flywheels, a flywheel of society, kind of like a flywheel in a machine where they, uh, William James calls also, also calls them a conservative agent of society. And that's because when you have a habit, you, don't, you no longer have to make that unpleasant choice again and again. Imagine if you had to, right? And, and I think that's kind of where people don't set themselves up for success. And even I didn't for a long time because I didn't appreciate how fundamental routines are or habits are to, a, to any kind of success. Even the slightest success requires routine, requires habits. Without it, you're, you have to make the hard choice every day in you and you're, you just won't be able to keep it up. Routine is the only thing, that conservative agent, so that you don't have to practice willpower again and again. So important, right? Cannot be overstated. So yeah, it comes down to habits, but also um, let, let's let's go with this pattern side of you and more. This there's also other problems com that come up. For example, he talks about um, he breaks it down to simple and complex ambivalence. Okay, simple ambivalence is like you set the alarm clock uh, before you go to sleep, and in that moment you value waking up and you you would be okay with waking up early, right? But then uh, the alarm goes off in the morning and it's like you're a different person with different values. And, and remember, you, you value X or you value Y in the fu future, right? So in that moment, you're valuing X, which is just to press the snooze button and go back to sleep, right? So there's you, f you find a kind of simple am ambivalence where at nighttime when you set the alarm, you're, you value something. But then when you wake up in the morning and the alarm goes off, you're, you're valuing something else. So there's some ambivalence there. But that kind of simple ambivalence, we call it simple because... There are workarounds, and for example, pre-commitment or commitment devices are super powerful. They're proven by psychologists, uh, psychological research. I guess an example would be, uh, I can't remember the term for them now, gosh. Uh, but yeah, commitment devices, for example, uh, let's say you, you tell a friend about your plan, then they're going to hold you accountable to it, or you pay someone money and you lose that money if you don't keep up with your plan. Or you make these if-then statements like if this, then whatever. There are lots of these commitment devices that commit you into a, a plan of action. But these commitment devices don't necessarily work so well with complex ambivalence, he calls them. Calls it. For example, alcoholism. There is no kind of sober, clear time where you have that time where you can set the pre-commitments because um, you're always wanting that drink. <laughs> Except maybe after a binge. But even after a binge, you're still looking for a drink to cure the hangover. So you, you rarely get the chance to kind of take a wider perspective, a long-term perspective. You're always kind of craving another drink and you don't even get around to uh, setting the metaphorical alarm clock, right? And there are further problems too because um, when you compare alcoholism and sobriety, what are you comparing? You're compar comparing two different levels of control. For example, uh, you're comparing a specific action with an abstract, long-term, fuzzy uh, concept, right? Like sobriety is a very fuzzy thing uh, when compared to alcoholism. There's no clear boundary because it always seems like you can be sober and yet still take another drink. That's what kills the alcoholic because they'll be sober for a long time and then they'll think, okay, well, you know, I could probably keep this up and I can just have another drink like everybody else is doing. They're, they're not lapsing into alcoholism. So I'm just going to have that one drink and I'll still be sober. And then, and then you have one and then you have another and then you have another and then all of a sudden, the, the lines that demarcate sobriety from alcoholism are totally blurred. And then you're back into being a full-blown uh, bender, full-blown alcoholic. Uh, so there's more problems with this kind of stuff, right? Anyways, I won't go too much into this. Let me just wrap up by saying that um, somehow we have to opt for these, these patterns. And you have to realize that these patterns, no specific portion of those patterns are going to rival or counterbalance uh, the kind of discomfort we have to face again and again. Uh, these patterns, like like 
all the patterns that I value in life, like let's say not eating junk food, that means again and again, day in and day out, day in and day out, I have to make the choice to not have some pleasure and opt for like a bland something else, right? A blander option. Um, <clears throat> like what does an alcoholic have to do when he picks sobriety? He's picking a pattern of behavior that entails again and again not having the drink and having a less pleasurable option. Uh, any kind of worthwhile pattern that that really lends itself to your life satisfaction entails doing this again and again. So what 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 do you have to do then to opt for these patterns? Well, one thing you have to do, you must do, is you have to sell yourself the pattern uh, in the present. <laughs> okay, uh, and and I haven't really gone around to, gone around to that section of the book where he talks about that. I kind of just skimmed that part, so I could probably talk more about it at length. Um, in a future video, but uh, I'm just going to riff on this. I think it just means you have to really sell that that worthwhile pattern of, like, let's say, sobriety or something in the present to yourself on a visceral level because our brain really sinks into, like, gustatory delights or, like, visual, yeah, gustatory, like, taste, raw, like, concrete things. That's what the brain evolved for. And then it got these abstract abilities, right? So you have to kind of sell, your, sell yourself these abstract ideas long-term ideas on, on a visceral kind of uh, something you can salivate over, right? Uh, so, so there's that, that kind of have to do the cognitive, re re cognitive restructuring necessary to sell yourself that pattern so that you can opt for it in the present. And of course, the other major, major, major thing I already talked about is habit, routine, so that you don't have to make these unpleasant choices again and again. And when you form a habit, what you're doing is you're following an abstract rule. You just follow the rule and you don't have to make the choice again and again. So it really is what William James called the ultimate conservative agent or the flywheel of society, right? Because like in a machine with a flywheel, once it's going, it'll just keep going, right? And you need to put resistance in its way, whatever, the machine will just keep going. So yeah, uh, really interesting, good ideas from this book. Um, I might talk about this more at length once I read more of the book, if I do. But I really got some things to think about, like how we really have to opt for these patterns of behavior and yeah, yeah, thanks.